Thank you, um, Angela and Gemma and Amri for joining us today uh, and welcome to um, everyone. Uh, so we're delighted to welcome you to this roundtable discussion on women's engagement in human rights. Um, it's hosted by the Athena Swan Committee of the School of Law of Queen's University Belfast for anyone who is not um, uh, aware. So I am Dr. Lauren Dempster. I'm a lecturer here in the School of Law and a member of the Athena Swan Committee. Um, so the committee is really delighted to welcome our three guests today um, who work uh, respectively in, in academia, in human rights work and in peace activism. So today's discussion complements a law pod series featuring interviews with each of the speakers. Um, I would encourage you to listen to those episodes when you have some time and I'll post the link in the chat bar. Um, so our panellists today are Professor Amory McElinden, uh, Gemma McCune and Angela Godfrey Goldstein. I will keep the introductions brief so that we can hear about the work that you do in your own words. Um, Amory, uh, sorry, Professor Amory McElinden is a professor in law here at Queen's University, Belfast. Gemma McCune is a solicitor with the Committee on the Administration of Justice, um, CAJ. Um, CAJ, for anyone who is not aware, is a Northern Ireland based uh, human rights NGO. And finally, Angela Godfrey Goldstein is a peace and anti-apartheid activist. Um, Angela is director of Jahalan Solidarity, a Palestinian organization. She set up to support the Jahalan Bedouin with capacity raising and advocacy, and also to advocate against Israeli occupation. And I will say now that Angela has given me permission today to <laughs> interrupt her if she's talking at length. So, um, but before moving on to our panelists, though, so, um, Professor Louise Malander, who is the School of Law Athena Swan champion, is going to say a few words. Thanks, Louise. Okay, thank you very much, Lauren. Um, I'm going to keep my remarks fairly brief because I'm sure, like you, all, I'm really excited to to hear from our speakers. But I think before we get started, it might be useful just to say why our Swan Committee is holding this event. So, as you're aware, today's roundtable is being held to mark International Women's Day. And this is a global day that's been held since 1911 to celebrate the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. It's also an occasion to draw attention to ongoing inequalities that women face and to call for action in accelerating women's equality. So like other departments in Queen's, the School of Law celebrates International Women's Day annually as part of our Athena Swan commitments to promoting awareness of gender equality among our staff and students. And for those of you who don't know, Athena Swan refers to a UK-wide program in which university departments commit to promoting uh, gender equality. This year, as you've heard from Lauren, the school's Swan Committee have chosen to celebrate the achievements of three inspiring women who research and advocate for human rights issues, either within the school or in collaboration with some of our academic colleagues. In, hoping, in hosting today's discussion, we hope to provide an opportunity to reflect on the distinctive contributions that are made by women working in different ways on human rights questions. We also felt that this discussion would be informative for students who are aspiring to careers in academia or, or human rights practice. I would very much like to thank our Swan Committee members, Ethna Dowds, Lauren Dempster, uh, Rachel Killian, Alice Panapinto and Declan Coyle for their work in organising today's event, as well as recording the Law Pod episodes that Lauren has already mentioned. These episodes feature uh, longer, fascinating interviews with each of our speakers, so if you haven't had a chance to listen to them yet, I'd strongly encourage you to do so. Also, of course, on behalf of our Swan Committee, I would very much like to thank our three speakers today. They've all been extremely generous in their time in agreeing to take part both in the podcast series and in this roundtable. I'm very much looking forward to a rich discussion on their experiences as women working in diverse human rights fields. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Louise. Um, so yes, uh, to echo Louise, thank you to all our speakers for joining us today. To begin with, um, perhaps just by way of introduction, you could each tell us a bit about your work and uh, particularly sort of what brought you to to, um, to work in the area that you do. Uh, Anne-Marie, we'll, we'll come to you first. Sure, thanks, Lauren. So I, I began, as I said on the Law Pod episode, I began by doing a degree in law at Queen's. I didn't really spread my wings very far at all in, in some senses. Then I went, uh, I did a master's actually again at also at Queen's in criminology and criminal justice. 
And while I was finishing my PhD, I went to Ulster for two years on a, on a lectureship. So I didn't really spread my wings very far at all, uh, particularly at the start of my career. But what brought me to the area was I've always liked sort of crime, even as a teenager, crime and criminal justice type issues. And those are the sort of books I read. So that was my natural sort of lead into law. It turned out that that wasn't what it actually was, contract and land and subjects that are miles away from that. But an initial interest in sort of crime, criminal justice got me into law. So that's how I got into what I was doing and then on through into academia. Great, um, Ray. Um, Gemma, do you want to introduce yourself briefly? Oh, you're muted. Yes, sorry. Yes, just to, um, re, I suppose, really just to follow up on that. I'm not sure whether I have travelled much further either than Amory. Um, I studied in Dublin and Trinity, did my law degree there, and then came to Queen's to do the Masters in Human Rights Law. I always had an interest really in justice matters, and, and I did the degree. I wasn't really sure what my sort of path was going to be, whether it was going to be practising as a barrister, solicitor, or neither, but did the, the, um, the Masters and then really enjoyed it worked in private practice, qualified as a solicitor, I worked in private practice for a number of years um, in primarily criminal and family law. Um, I then got an opportunity to work in the Human Rights Commission, which I did for over a year, which um, on their casework legal um, side of things, which was really interesting. And since 2009, I've been with CAJ. So um, as you said, CAJ is an independent human rights group, a non-governmental organisation based in Belfast. and. I always was interested in their work. Whenever I was undergrad and LLM, I was aware of their work and had volunteered. So I knew about CAGA and what their sort of their focus was and sort of dealing with, I suppose, really holding the government to account to the international human rights obligations. That's sort of the overall sort of objective. We focus on different areas of work, one of which is really combating impunity and addressing sort of the failure to really deal with the human rights abuses over the from the conflict and unresolved troubles is one of the aspects of work that I focus on. So I, I really, really find it it's fascinating. It's sort of legal policy research. It's all of the above. So um, it's not sort of the, the, I suppose, the usual trajectory into sort of private practice and then staying within that field, but um, I really enjoy it. And I think it's something, it's, it's interesting and challenging. So um, I suppose I, I've ended up here and I'm still with CAJ. So it's, it's an enjoyable, enjoyable work. Great, thank you, Gemma. Uh, Angela, would you like to say a bit about your work? Sure, okay. Um, I came to Israel in 1981. Um, prior to that, I'd lived for a couple of years in South Africa, but I'm basically English from London. And my career until then was the theatre. Um, there's a lot to be said about being a woman in the theatre in those days, and we'll hopefully get there. Uh, I worked for lawyers in order to pay the rent, uh, including being a paralegal and a court clerk in London at the Central Criminal Court, the Old Bailey. Um, when I went to Sinai on a holiday, I actually fell in love with, with desert. And after two years of going regularly, I then went to work there as an environmental activist. And I went to Cairo and I went to Amman to ask permission Friends of the Earth Middle East fundraised. We got $234,000 committed for a three-year sustainable tourism project. Uh, and then Netanyahu started unwinding Oslo. And what had been in Cairo, welcome, we need people like you in Sinai, became very fast, please get out of my office before somebody sees you. And it's political, not personal. So that for me was a very clear marker as to what the politics were really all about in terms of Oslo. I was four years in Sinai. I, I think that I had an incredibly productive time there. If I look back on it, it was one of the richest experiences in my life. Um, I had to have an operation and I had it in Cairo. I lost the use of the left arm and had to come back for to Israel for physiotherapy. Um, coming back, obviously, it was a very different mentality than the Angela who had gone to work in Sinai. I was comfortable in Arab culture. I speak basic Arabic and I had success as an activist, which therefore made me very much more confident and more likely to take initiatives. I think that was something that I learned from, from the experience of, you know, 
just diving in the deep end and learning as you go. Um, there are probably much better ways of having done all of that. But um, when I came back to Israel after I'd done the physiotherapy and got the arm back, uh, then it was the second intifada. And there wasn't much activism going on. But I really wanted then to understand more of what had been uh, going on during Oslo, because I think most Israelis uh, and maybe even many Palestinians were under the impression that we're making peace. Everybody wants peace. They're doing it. Let them get on with it. Settlements, bargaining chips, whatever. Uh, and therefore, it was very instructive to see everything bro breaking down and to know from my own experience that Netanyahu had deliberately unwound Oslo. And the question then being, where do we go to from there? And for me, just to learn more about the issues uh, led me to being for nine years advocacy officer with the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Um, and really that brings us to today. Once you see what's going on, once you understand it, it becomes very difficult to walk away. That's, that's it for now. Thank you for that, Angela. Um, it's great to actually to have such diverse experiences here and, and three speakers who make change in quite different um, forums. So um, I'll also say to our, our audience, um, we'll, we'll of course have some time for questions. So um, you can put questions in the chat um, and we'll have a, a bit of time at the end if, if you want to ask um, questions just with turning your microphone on. Um, my second question then, I guess, is a, is a bit of a big one, but um, as we're having this discussion on and for International Women's Day, I would be keen to hear your reflections on the intersection of, of gender and, and the work that you do. So I know that the language of as a woman may not be appropriate for everyone. Um, so I guess what we're thinking of here, sort of the implications of identifying as a woman or, or as female or, or having a feminine identity with, with your work. So. Have you faced any particular challenges as a result of this intersection with your gender? Or indeed, have you found that there are particular um, perspectives or strengths that can you've been able to bring to your work as a result of, of being a woman? Um, I don't know who we want to go to first on that. Does anyone have a preference on who comes in? Angela, do you want to come in on that one? Uh I would say that for me, the intersection of being a woman has been a very interesting one because on the one hand, I was in boarding school age six with lots of little girls. So I was very used to being surrounded all my life until 18 with just little girls on the whole uh, and felt very lost in the company of men. I even got myself a job as a, a barmaid uh, in Ealing just to learn to speak to men when I was 18. And I had a good education. I was lucky. My father never discriminated against me in terms of education, possibly because I think he had an aunt who was a doctor, Dr. Rebecca Goldstein in the East End in Sydney Street. Um, and therefore, it was always something that, you know, we, we knew very well in the 70s about feminism. I have to confess, I didn't know that much about Ruth Bader Ginsburg until more recently. But in those days, my, my biggest hero was Dame Elizabeth Lane, who was a judge and the only one. Uh, and I also knew about one or two women barristers. But I would say that as I have grown, being a woman has less relevance for me than it did once upon a time. When I was an actor, I called myself an actor, not an actress. Yes, I was aware of the casting couch. It was taken for granted. And the abuse that took place in those days, hopefully by now with the Me Too movement, is much less. Um, I would say I think, and I think I said this in the podcast, I think of myself as a person. I don't think of myself as a gender. Um, but I have been in situations where looking back, especially when you start to become involved in or, or reading about the uh, suppression methods that men use against women, yes, absolutely, it has all been thrown at 
probably most of us. Um, in terms of how being a woman impacts my work, um, Palestine is patriarchal, so is Bedouin society, whether in the occupied Palestinian territories or inside Israel or indeed in Egypt where I was working. And I think that at times I've been very aware that the fact that I'm English makes it easier for them to accept me because I'm an outsider. I'm not Jewish, I'm half Jewish. Um, I have always been an outsider and that's a huge strength, uh, even though there are times when it's quite a burden. So I would say that my nature, it's quite complex, aren't we all? So on the one hand, I'm very strong. I'm super sensitive. I can come across as very gentle, which makes it easier for men. I'm not somebody that comes at them straight slap on and, you know, you do what I tell you to do and da, da, da. I'm, I'm very gentle and rather polite in English, um, but, but probably quite tough deep down. So I know that when I've been, for example, invited to speak at a conference in Amsterdam at the university, it was a feminist conference and they took me on one side first and they said, listen, somebody had dropped out and I happened to be with Bedouin in Amsterdam at the time. Um, and it was about Israeli women activists. So they said, look, you have to, I'm sorry, but according to this conference, you have to identify as a feminist. And being a nasty soul, I got up and said, I do not identify as a feminist because I don't think of myself as a woman. And they kind of at the end said, well, we had all the different approaches and, and viewpoints. But it, it's an interesting uh, paradox, isn't it? There are times when um, if I have makeup on and men react to me differently, it actually angers me. Um, on the other hand, I have to say there are times when I like to shock people by putting on makeup. The older you get, the harder it is. Uh, and that's another whole ism. But um, at the end of the day, I think that we women are very well equipped to deal with certain things that men find harder. Let's put it that way. Uh, and therefore, there, is, there are levels of subtlety, nuance, compassion, um, identification, um, a maternal uh, urge, shall we say. Men will say they have the feminine side to them, and they are absolutely right, I hope. But nevertheless, I think that if you look around in, in Israel, Palestine, many, many strong women doing amazing work, um, many Anglo women running. NGOs, which is interesting. Um, and that's that's more or less it. I think that we've moved forwards where we don't have all of that stuff about women and the problems and the you know moods and all of that stuff. So so I do see this as a an onward move, but on the other hand, much of the battles need to be refought regularly because it doesn't just go forwards, it goes back and forwards a bit, yeah. Yeah, definitely, that's an important reminder, Angela, um, of the need to, to keep pushing for these things. Um, Gemma, from your experience of, of working on, on human rights issues in, in Northern Ireland, do you have any particular reflections on, on where gender fits into that picture? Yeah, really just to echo what Angela said, like I never really defined myself as a female human rights lawyer. I was just choosing to do human rights law. And you know, I came from a family, I come from a family of four girls. So very strong, female, supportive, empowering sort of background. So from that perspective, not necessarily. I think um, in the criminal sphere and certain areas of, of law, it can be by nature adversarial and aggressive. And obviously if you're in a male dominated environment, whether it's a police station or court, that obviously has a different dynamic, but in this particular sphere of public law and judicial review, um, by its very nature, I don't think you necessarily have to have those overtly aggressive tendencies to be effective. Collaboration is a massive piece of work that we all engage in, and I have found working collaboratively with other females, whether it's barrister, senior, junior, or other NGOs, that's a very, very powerful tool. And obviously that isn't to say that my male colleagues don't do that, but I think it's something that the women, the sort of women empowering other women really can be Quite inspirational because the, these areas of work are quite heavy and a lot of the work I do is working with victims and survivors and obviously Anne-Marie and Angela can speak about that too but 
it can be quite draining. So to have that soundboard and to have the sort of the support of colleagues and, you know, just to, they're going through the same thing and they can empathize. I think that really can be very powerful and it's not really measured in any way, you know, it's not visible, but I think it's something that really, um, I would find it, it inspires me to keep going, you know, so I think that would really be a sort of a powerful tool working collaboratively and we work, we work locally, obviously, with a lot of NGOs, but then we also reach up to the UN level and Committee Council of Europe. So to have that sort of spotlight and sort of solidarity from those angles really kind of it refreshes you and reaffirms that you're you're not sort of on a lone path, that, that you have collaboration and support behind you. So I think I think that really would sort of sum it up. But I've never really defined myself as a, a woman doing this job. I'm a human rights lawyer and that comes first, I really. Thank you, Gemma. Um, Amory, do you have any uh, comments on this question? Mine's very similar, actually, Lauren, so I'll keep it brief. I, I'm exactly the same. I don't think of myself as a, a woman either, you know, all the time in terms of work. That's a big issue I face. I'm a person. I treat people the same, you know, as a person rather than a man or a woman. I think, to be honest, it sort of impacted more for me at the beginning of my career. So, you know, when I first joined the law school, I had children soon after. There were very few people in the school who were parents at the time, men or women. And, and that's difficult because you're then into conversations about, oh, I can't stay for a six o'clock lecture because I have children. That's all gotten much better in terms of, you know, all the, the SWAN agenda, the Queen's Gender Initiative, sort of more broadly family friendly policies. That has really helped, I think, uh, parents and men and women as parents. I think sort of where it, it has sort of been more difficult for me in terms of the research or the academic side where the the gender might come into your fieldwork is around, and Angela, uh, so Angela and Gemma touched on it there, particularly Gemma, around fieldwork with survivors or in the field of trauma and, and sexual abuse. I think, to be honest, I, think I said this on my Law Pod episode as well, that in doing fieldwork about child abuse, it actually impacted m surprisingly so actually the first fieldwork project I did after I had children I found it actually quite difficult to go in and then hear experiences of of other children's uh, about abuse even though it wasn't firsthand you're hearing from professionals and you almost have to put a guard up of you like and think well that's I'll leave that side of me it doesn't feel natural but I'll leave that sort of family side of me or caring side so it just so I can do the work so I think that can be a challenge around you know trying to maybe get that balance between not being insensitive to the work, but desensitised enough that you can get through it if you're dealing with traumatic sub sub substances. And that can be a challenge, I think, as a woman to try and, you know, keep that balance. But in general, as I said, it's not something that I keep to the fore all the time and just get on with it. Thank you for that, Amory. I think possibly something then that, that follows on from, from what you were saying and what you touched on in, in your podcast, Amory and Gemma as well. And Gemma, you've already touched on it a little bit today, is I guess something that comes through really in, in the podcast, but also in a lot of the, the commentary that we're seeing around International Women's Day is the importance of building relationships and building networks of, of having solidarity. Um, I think the language you used in your podcast, Gemma, was not, not to put yourself in a silo. Um, so perhaps I'd appreciate hearing your, your thoughts on the benefits of, of relationships, uh, of building professional relationships, and if you have any sort of words of advice for anyone who's maybe still studying or early career on how they, how they go about building those networks. Um, Gemma, we'll come to you first, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I suppose from the work that I do, the, the nature of the work is that we engage with the different NGOs, but those NGOs also have um, membership. So you can have individual membership, for example, CAJ co-convenes a equality coalition, with unison so individuals can join that as well as a membership uh, as individual groups so and you know whether you're a student or you're practicing there are ways to feed in your whether it's in a personal capacity or as a legal representative you can actually feed into these processes and really learn i suppose like i know the law society and the bar council have very much encouraged sort of the 100 years since women have been able to qualify and there's a lot of encouragement in respect of that area of work but more generally i think reach out, find out whatever area it is you're interested in, whether it's children's rights, like there's a plethora of the Children's Law Centre, the children, NICI, the Children's Commission and Food Youth. There's loads of areas of work. If you have an interest, volunteer, I think is what everybody says, but it is practical and it does give you an insight into whether actually it's something that you really are interested in or whether it's something you want to develop further. Volunteer, there's loads of boards that are looking for um, executive members, obviously that may require more experience, but get your foot in the door, find out what you're interested in, 
obviously with COVID, we're all working remotely. There may be remote working that can be done, remote um, volunteering that can be done for various NGOs. So just really get your foot in the door and find out what your area of interest is and put yourself out there. Like, you know, we, we can't be sort of behind the door and lacking confidence. If you think you have something to bring to the table, whether it's content or whether it's even social media skills, things like that are invaluable particularly to NGOs with limited resources. So if you feel that you can help someone develop their website better, help, you know, there's amazing podcasts going on, as we know, you know, really innovative working, you know, that really you can, you have skills that you can bring to the table that may not necessarily fit into the mould of what a human rights lawyer or activist is doing. So think of what skills you can bring and, you know, don't be afraid to put yourself forward and really engaged because we all want to help you know it is a very under-resourced um, area of work the voluntary sector and um, so we do rely on volunteers quite a lot um over the years so try and get the experience and obviously then if you collaborate you'll maybe it may lead to a job um, in future years and really just maintain contacts you know there's loads of particularly with covid there's so many online events i've gone to more webinars than i've ever done in my life before and you know obviously it's virtual and you miss the human contact but the information sharing, you know, internationally or locally is amazing. So just really try and build and develop these networks and offer your services. You know, you have something to contribute. If you're interested and passionate, there's you always have a role to play in making a difference. So yeah. thanks, Gemma. And that, that's really helpful advice in terms of thinking about the many ways you can get involved in activism. I think, you know, sometimes people might think if um, you know, it's always like, you know, being at the front of a demonstration or, you know, being on stage giving a speech, but there's all sorts of, of ways in which um, we, we can um, affect change. Um, Anne-Marie, do you want to come in on this question? Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Well, I think you just said, Lauren, internal and external relationships. Relationship building is very important to academic careers as well. And I mean, on one level, as I said in the, the podcast, I think it's easier to do as you get more established. People ask you to do things or to speak at conferences. And so you make the connections that way. But people can do it from the very start of their academic career. It's probably something looking back I wish I had done more of you know, earlier in my career. So from, from a PhD researcher or from a lecturer level, you I mean, go to seminars in other schools and faculties. When you get you, when you become a lecturer, think of joining things like academic council or senate. You meet people from across the university. There's a real strength in that in forming relationships, not only with other academics, but with people from professional services across the university. So as, as Gemma said there, you know, you know, reach out to people, you know, and th there's real value in connections, certainly within the academic sphere. The big move now is towards interdisciplinary thinking, not just your own discipline. So it's, it's, it is important to sort of go to events, pro professional and academic conferences, whatever, whatever route you can. Even things like publishing for non-academic journals, blogs, all those sort of early things you can do sort of to make links and to get your, your name known. But yeah, it's important that it's something to think about from the outset of a career rather than, than later on. Very often it's only when you come to promotion, one of the things is the extent of your external collaborations. And unfortunately for me, that's the time I started to think about it and thought this is probably something I should have done a lot sooner. So yeah, from the start of your academic career, I think that's that's a good way. And there's lots of ways you can do it internally and externally. Great. Thank you, Amory. Uh, Angela, do you have any reflections on uh, the importance of building relationships or ways to do it? Yeah. Um, okay. I think I'm naturally curious and therefore um, always fascinated by what other people are saying, doing, thinking, um, and the Israeli left is not the most welcoming uh, environment, it has to be said. I think because we see and, and feel deeply uh, the pain, um, but it's known to be slightly cannibalistic. And therefore, the, the, there has always been for me in the 20 years since I came back from Sinai, this sort of dance of these are the people that we are working together as allies with. Um, Palestinians, obviously I'm not a Palestinian and therefore the ability to identify 100% isn't there. Uh, but it's, it's a dynamic that is, that is very um, political <laughs> in a, with a small p. One is constantly having to, you know, check who is what and where. 
Uh, having said which, I've been for 20 years or so guiding groups, and therefore my networking has been facilitated enormously. I mean, if I look at the leadership of Jewish Voice for Peace or Code Pink or J Street and various other large uh, solidarity groups, Palestine Solidarity Campaign and so forth, I know many of them because I have had the pleasure, privilege, whatever, of, of taking them to show them what's going on. Uh, networking has always been fundamental to me, um, probably because on the one hand, I said the curiosity, but also the need to, to work towards change. Who is going to change this? Journalists and diplomats, part of that target group, obviously. And therefore, for some years, I was taking journalists and diplomats down to Sinai on holiday for long weekends so that they could have a good time, so that we enhanced our relationships. Um, and that obviously fed into the work quite considerably. Um, in terms of meetings, I think that as an Israeli, I feel a duty to speak out. Um, I know that I'm known as talking too much, but sometimes it's because as an Israeli, you can say things which Palestinians can't, which internationals can't, which diplomats aren't allowed to, uh, and therefore one feels the duty to express those statements. Um, it's wonderful working with people when you're pulling together. I have people I love dearly, my co-director, my social media campaigner, my communications consultant are all people I love. We love each other. We trust each other. We know each other very well. Um, sometimes we've been through harder times and some of that is always about money. Um, but it's something that when the heart is, is centered and at, the, and at the middle of what you're doing, um, working with other people who are brilliant it's it's hugely helpful. It's just such a relief and such a release because otherwise you're in this conflict dealing with, I mean, I think it was, was it Gemma who was talking about burnout? Uh, burnout is a, is a regular factor. And, and frankly, I can't deal with things like torture. I just, I knew very early on, torture ain't for me. I don't want to wake up screaming in the middle of the night and I believe I would. Um, it's bad enough with all of the other uh, huge uh, repressions and policies that are so dehumanizing. We haven't really talked about, you know, what human rights is. Um, and I think of it as being a warning against war and violence where it's going to break out. But in a place like Israel, they do not appreciate it. You know, we are very much stigmatized, um, fought against, delegitimized, defunded when they can, and so forth. Um, when we were talking about burnout, maybe that's coming up in terms of advice, but then I should mention this book at some point. It's the Idealist Survival Kit, 75 Simple Ways to Avoid Burnout written by uh, an international aid worker, Alessandra Pigny, who used to work here. Uh, and, and that is a Bible of full of uh, advice, just one page meditations of how to deal with things and not let it get to your soul. I think I talked too much, huh? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was enjoying that. Thank you, Angela. Um, yeah, and I think it's a, it's a very important time to, to flag the risk of burnout when COVID has brought so many added pressures for all of us. Um, I guess then, uh, I'm keen to open open the, the floor to, to questions soon. Um, so I guess my last, the last question for me anyway is, is do you have any um, overarching words of wisdom for, for people starting out and wanting to engage in human rights activism or, or research on, on justice issues? Um, Anne-Marie, will we come to you first? Sorry, I was just trying to, having trouble on muting. Uh, I suppose there's a few things, Lauren. So if, in terms of academic careers, it, it can be very demanding and long hours, as we know, and increasingly so. So I think it's important to try and have a, a, 
a work-life balance and avoid that burnout as Angela talks about so you need to find something whatever you enjoy doing a hobby or, or on your own just to get away from it because it's a job that can really you could work all the time you're never finished your, your list is always very full to do the other thing I would say is in terms of the work-life balance it's also important to try and keep the balance between teaching and research so you know, teaching and admin can can will will basically expand to fill the space. So you need to find some space to do research. And again, that's about working out what will work best for you. So for some people, that's an hour a week. For some people, it's a block. Personally, I can't work an hour at a time and research. I need a block. That might mean I mightn't get to research for a couple of weeks. That's okay. It's just it's just whatever finding out what works for you. And uh, the other thing I would say is apart from the relationship thing and reaching out, which we've already covered, that's really important. The other thing I would say in terms of research is about quality. So it's, you know, earlier in your career, it's tempting to do things to fill your CV and that that's okay as well. But I think quality is the byword and that won't let you down. That's advice I was given when I started out and I think it's still true. So focus on quality rather than the amount of research you're doing. But generally, I would say go for it. It's demanding career, but it's, it's very worthwhile. It's very diverse. No two days are the same. And I would encourage anybody to go for it. Thank you, Emery. Um, Gemma, do you want to come in on, on this one? Yeah, um, I think really just to repeat um, the, the sort of experiences that Emery has said in academia can transfer. I think, first of all, believe that you have something to, of value to bring. Do you know, do you know, don't doubt that you have something, whether it's of substance, whether it's in, like, you know, for example, we had volunteers attend court whenever we were doing court observations. Do you know, doing that is an amazing piece of work. We didn't have the resources. We had volunteers helping with our social media and sort of our, our website. So there's different elements and strengths that you can contribute. But I think don't doubt that you have something to bring to the table. Get experience. I think that's probably the most obvious thing. Get experience and find out what area of work you're going to sort of um, you think you would have. Don't really have preordained ideas that you're going to follow a certain career path. You know, you may practice as a solicitor and then decide actually you want to go in house or you want to get into academia. So be open to opportunities. I think the thing about having work-life balance is very important. My job, we have very good flexible working issues and working patterns, and that's obviously sort of mandatory, but the job is sometimes you do take it home with you just by the nature of the work that you're working with. So have an outlet, something, you know, outside of work, and that will really help sort of balance your, your sort of your work commitments that you have sort of day to day. But I think really, given the fact that we have so many threats to human rights at present, you know, we've got threats to the Human Rights Act, we've got a government that's continually providing misinformation. We've got media that's continually providing misinformation about what human rights are, who they're for. There's so much work to be done to counter the false narratives. So even engaging in social media and challenging the, the tabloid type of the, the human rights charter for criminals and the human rights is for these foreigners. So I think really it's an important role for us all, you know, as simple as actually countering false information in the media can be very effective, but in respect of your career, I think just get experience and volunteer and really just follow your passion and believe that you have something of value to bring. You mightn't get the first job, it may take you a few years to get the, the, your dream job, but don't give up. Volunteer part time, you know, use your expertise and really just, I think the, the, the human rights sector is a very um, depleted one and so severely under resourced. So I would imagine that anybody volunteering their expertise would be well received. Thank you, Gemma. And that was valuable advice there on the things that we can do sort of day to day and the, the smaller scale to, to um, um, promote human rights. Uh, Angela, uh, do you have words of wisdom for anyone considering a career in activism? OK, not necessarily wise, but here we go. Um, I think that human rights work, it's very sacred in a certain way. Uh, and I'm sure that anybody going into it, and I hope that Anne-Marie uh, and Gemma agree with me, anybody going into it is going to develop and strengthen and change for the better. But certainly there are, as, as has been mentioned, the strains and the stresses. So something like a very black sense of humor is useful. And I found it, you know, something that binds one with other activists. Um, the blacker, the better, especially the crazier, the situation. Um, I agree that it's necessary to have downtime and preferably somewhere to go that is completely out of the um, arena. I think it's necessary, if you can, 
to be as aware of your ego as possible and to be able to rise above it or to get it out of the way. Because unfortunately, as there are stress levels, um, people suffer and the ego rises. And therefore, there are more opportunities for getting into trouble, shall we say, if you can't go egoless and just put it aside. Um, I want to shout out for Alice Panepinto here because we spent a week together in Sweden. And it was the first time in many speaking tours, and there was a Bedouin guy with us, uh, it was the first time that I had ever had anybody on a panel, on a stage alongside me, as generous with her time in order that I should benefit. And usually, not always, but very often you're in those situations and everybody wants the most time, you know. No, I, uh, and there's this sort of competitive nature. Whereas Alice, her attitude was, I'm here to help you. And she really did. Um, so it can be done. I would say uh, also in, in advice to people wanting to go into human rights, human rights work is something that you can look in the mirror afterwards at yourself and feel not necessarily narcissistic, but you can feel good about yourself. You can feel you're doing something really worthwhile, something that can change the world in a small way. Whereas I think Many people in our lives are motivate, motivated sorry, by wanting to uh, rise up a greasy pole, by wanting to earn large amounts of money, by status, peer pressure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and there's so much that can be easily corrupted in all of that. Whereas I think that this line of work, it has a very deep purity and those of us working in it, we recognize each other as good souls. One of the benefits is you meet amazing human beings. Um, I think that you will become, as I say, stronger and hopefully more real, able to understand that we all have a responsibility for whatever the state of play is around us and that we can change it. Um, hearing how badly human rights are disrespected, um, it's tragic, isn't it? Because it's something that that is so necessary behind so many of the political um, movements, if you take Trumpism, if you take populism, if you take fascism, for example, people have grievances. If we can solve those grievances with democratic means, with social support, with community welfare at its heart, uh, we're living in a much better world. So I find the well, I mean, obviously, I'm not a Tory voter, let's put it this way. Um, and here in Israel, nor am I a, a, a Bibiist. I vote for the joint list, which is the Arab-Israeli, um, mostly Palestinian 48ers. Um, I think that's enough. I'm, I'm about to go wandering off into, you know, what is it that creates fascism? But anyway. Oh, thank you, Angela. I, I would love to hear that as well, but I guess that we should probably stick with our IWD focus for today. Um, thank you all. There's some really, really valuable reflections in there. Um, I'm going to open the floor now. Does anyone have any questions or, or comments? You can um, type them in the chat bar or use the raise hand function, which is just along the top of your window. Oh, sorry, my um, my Teams doesn't always show the raise hand thing, so it's a bit of a risk as to whether or not that'll work. Uh, okay. Um, oh, there's hands going up now. Um, uh, we'll come to uh, Anna and then Louise after. I'm not quite sure what order they went up in, but Anna, do you want to come in? Yeah, hi, I'll come in briefly. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm familiar with Gemma and Anne-Marie's work, so really 
even more inspired than usual to hear a wee bit more about it, but I'm, I'm a bit newer to um, Angela's work, so that was really fascinating, Angela. I just had a quick question. Um, as Louise will know, um, we've been doing a wee bit of work recently looking at um, cause lawyers, and I had a particular interest in some of the gender dynamics um, associated with what we were exploring in terms of the experience of lawyers in various different conflicted and transitional societies. And one of the sites we looked at was Israel and Palestine. And um, reviewing our interview data recently, it struck me that a couple of the the human rights lawyers and activists we spoke to suggested that basically um, they referred to this thing called pink washing the occupation and the sense that gender a good record in gender equality was paraded by the Israeli state partly as a means of of obfuscating and covering up what you know the kind of uh, the the occupation for want of a better word and other human rights abuses so there was a sense that we've got if we're seen to be good at, at, at gender equality you know it might distract from some of of these other issues um and that was something that really fascinated me as i say it was referred to as kind of pink washing these other harms so i was just wondering was that something that uh, you would detect in your work or is that something that you have um any uh, reflections on i'll turn off my thing now Was that to everybody or to me specifically? I wasn't sure. Beg your pardon, Angela. Sorry, that was to you specifically. Okay, okay. So yes, one is very aware of it. Um, on the one hand, Israel does it has some sort of an image. I remember this when I was at school in England and an Israeli girl came to our school for a year. Uh, it has the image of equality, of women, Air Force pilots and combat soldiers uh, of women who are quite high up in, you know, banks, leading banks and so forth. On the other hand, there is a, a long and very deep um, history of sexual exploitation, shall we put it this way. Um, uh, people are now talking about dead politicians and how they were known at the time as rapists, but it was a, a, a hushed up secret sort of thing. So probably like most countries, Israel has all of that. And yes, it does have a very thriving LGBTQ community, especially in Tel Aviv, which I think is one of the um, centers of the world in terms of that tourism. But they use it to cover up the occupation. And I would absolutely 100% agree with, with the human rights lawyers you met with. Um, Israel is very, when I say Israel, I mean the establishment, the government, the uh, leading political parties are very expert at avoiding dealing with issues by distracting with something like the pink washing. Um, <sighs> Is there, is there progress being made on this? Uh, we have one member of cabinet who is gay. Uh, unfortunately, the guy is very right wing. And I would say, for me, it's really strange because I grew up with gays um, from the age of about 14. And my experience of most gays, uh, they're very liberal because they know what it is to be in a discriminated against so badly uh, whereas this guy is a, he's the minister of police uh, and he is um, very much somebody that that we on the left uh, the more liberal Israelis have a big problem with yeah thank you for that uh, question Anna and, and thanks Angela for for giving us that um, response um, we have a question from from Louise and then I'll pick up Emma on your question in the chat uh, Louise do you want to come in sure thank you very much everybody that was really fascinating um, it's always a pleasure for me to hear about Gemma and Anne Marie's work because I know them well and um, Angela was just it was fantastic having having been to Israel and Palestine a few times for research it was great to hear your reflections on it I also was struck how much of what you all said really resonated with my own experiences particularly around doing field work or entering into particular sites and what that means as a woman and also of course the importance of relationships and collaboration in our profession so I think that's all 
was all really valuable, as were the um, the tips for people starting out in this career. I think that's always great advice for us all. My question is going in a slightly different direction. I think Lauren touched briefly on the pandemic when some of the discussion, and I was really struck this morning looking at the headlines for International Women's Day that the COVID-19 pandemic has probably set gender equality back by a few decades. And I was just wondering uh, like, like, about your reflections on what that has meant for your areas of work, either perhaps in your own experiences or in the types of work that your organisations are doing. Oh, um, Marie, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I was going to say, I can come in if you want, Lauren. Oh. I, I think, I mean, it's important, first of all, not to be too sort of gendered, because I realise that, you know, men have children as well, and it does impact. So I'm maybe only going to speak from my own experience rather than offend anybody. But I know from speaking to female colleagues in the school and from my own experience, my sense is that the working day has really just at least one and a half times, if not double the time you fit in school, sometimes... Mm -hmm. You know, online meetings still have to happen. I'm not teaching at the minute. I'm involved in a lot of management, but the working days are much longer. So it's scaled back a bit now. I've got more into a routine, but I know from not just my own experience speaking to others, it really has. It's cut down the time for research, I think, as well. I think we will see that. And it's important that's recognised from promotions. People's, you know, time for research are cut because teaching and admin and meetings have to come first. So I think the work-life balance is, is much more challenging than it was. And, and that's probably is the thing I fear that it will impact on women's careers. But I know the university are, are looking at this and there is a, a part on the form that will take account of the impact of COVID on things like promotion and progressions. But I think it is definitely challenging. I think I'm just echo what um, Amory has said. On a personal level, obviously, those that have family or childcare commitments are finding that they are taking the the um, disproportionate responsibility, whether they've got supportive partners or not. By default, the housework and the homework, unfortunately, does generally fall to the mother. And working at home in this environment, obviously, whether you've got supportive work colleagues or not, it is difficult. Um, but I suppose more generally, we would be concerned about human rights abuses and things like, you know, the, the incidents in domestic violence and unreported incidents of abuse, whether children or, or women, and really to document that and to provide support to those people that really don't have any means of communicating. You know, there's issues about digital poverty as well and children and, and sort of the engagement with schools and whether the right to education has been properly facilitated for by those disadvantaged. So there's a plethora of issues really across the board. but. I suppose those that were always disproportionately socioeconomically deprived, that's only been exacerbated and whether it's poverty, education or through abuse. So they're all human rights issues that we, I know efforts have been made by sort of various institutions to try and reach out to the most vulnerable. But I think the pandemic has only really exacerbated, exacerbated those um, real uh, experiences that women are, women and, and children and, and those most marginalised are experiencing and really we all need to find a way to be more creative in responding to it, to know, not just working in our usual silos. We need to be sort of outreaching. And I know a lot of great women's groups are doing that, women's aid, and a lot of the, the collaborative working has been done in the women's sector. So I suppose more generally, I would be concerned about that. But on a, on a human level, I do accept that women working in, in, in the last year or so have definitely had their workload exponentially increased. And I would be concerned that we would be it would detrimentally affect us going forward. So I, I hope that all our workplaces and, and more generally that there is a flexibility um, given towards that. Um, so I think that's they're, they're my, my views on that. Angela, you're I, muted. Yeah, I don't okay. have much to add to this because I don't have a family mm -hmm. and I'm not working in an institution which um, expects me to be producing. I'm very much working from home, running an NGO, nonprofit, and working in the field with Bedouin, uh, who live still in relatively um, rural surroundings, not necessarily deep into desert anymore, but they have been far less impacted by COVID than people living in cities or towns, uh, to the extent that many Bedouin, especially women, are disbelieving in in covid they they don't think that it's for real they think it's a big hoax 
And one of the things that we've had to do is, is impress on people that it is necessary to wear masks, especially if you have visitors because you can't know. Um, so there's a certain, um, a certain amount of impact from COVID on, on our work. Obviously, funding has been held up or stopped. Um, but I find it very, very, very sad when I hear that, that the status of women has gone backwards so badly. You know, here the status of women is already badly back. Um, it's interesting to note, for example, that many of the, especially the Scandinavian countries, are sending women as ambassadors. And I think that that's a very deliberate example. Um, but COVID, as I say, I don't really have the same experience and, and therefore I don't think I can help you that much. Thank you. That was that was an interesting reflection on the on the Bedouin um, context, Angela. Um, thank you all for your responses on that. We have one uh, question in in the chat for Angela, and then I think that'll I'll bring us to time and keen not to go over time because I know everyone has various other responsibilities. So um, Emma Kelly has asked you, Angela. She says, "I'm going from a career in performing arts to doing a master's in politics. Do you think there are any parallels between acting and activism?" And do you think you gained any transferable skills that have been valuable to you in your career now? Uh, I think we need a one hour session together, just the two of us on this, because it's a huge answer. Uh, the small, quick answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, acting, performing arts, it's very much about getting out and doing something. It's very much about changing people's uh, perceptions. Education is very much at the heart, I think, of theatre, I hope, uh, and community and healing. So I think that to take that forwards into uh, political action, it, it's, you know, if I'd been intelligent about my theatre career, I would have been working in prisons and hospitals and street theatre. As it was at my age, when I was in my 20s, I wanted to be in the West End. And when I got there, it was a huge disappointment. So, yeah, I do believe that having the basic tools of communication also hopefully helps to get messages across and therefore is important for advocacy. I think if you're in the performing arts, the chances are that you are close to literature. Maybe you enjoy writing and that is also hugely useful. Um, I would love to follow up on this to give it more thought and get back to you. Is that possible? Um, Emma, do you want to um, send an email address or something through to one of us and we can pass it on to yes. Angela? Yeah, of course. So, sorry, hi. Thank you for answering my question. Um, yeah, that would be fabulous if I maybe get in touch with one of you somehow. I can fire through an email address and we can hopefully follow that up. But yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I'll pop um, my email address in the chat, um, Emma, and then you just give me a shout and I'll put you in touch with Angela. Um, Okay, so um, that brings us to four o'clock. I just want to thank again all of our speakers. So Anne-Marie McAlinden, Gemma McCoon and Angela Gold Godfrey Goldstein. That was um, a really valuable conversation. Um, I have lots of food for thought for myself, so I'm sure our audience will have as well. And I know International Women's Day is full of all sorts of events, so I really appreciate all of you and, and all of our um, um, audience joining us for, for an hour today. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.